My name is Jeremy Zawadny. I work at Craigslist, and uh, I'm going to talk about some of our uh, data stores in use at Craigslist, some SQL and lots of no SQL. And um, first of all, I just want to say thanks for coming to this session. Um, there are at least two other sessions on the schedule at this time that I'd be in if I wasn't standing up here. So I know it's always a challenge to choose what you want to go see, and hopefully this will be interesting. I'm going to go kind of quickly. I've got about 22 slides to get through in about 45 minutes or so, and I'd like to leave some time for questions. Um, it's always tricky doing a talk like this because I don't know what it is that people do and don't know already and what, what things you're going to want to know about. Um, if you saw the, uh, <clears throat> the keynote that Martin Mikos did uh, the other morning, he said, uh, one of the things he said, which I thought was really interesting, is he said, there is no stack anymore. And uh, I'm inclined to believe that. I remember back when we, we built things on a LAMP stack and it was, everything was very straightforward. There were not a lot of choices to make. And I think we've come a long way in the last, uh, last 10 or 12 years in terms of databases and data stores and deciding where we can put stuff. Um, so instead of a stack, I think of it more like a bag of cats. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the expression about trying to herd cats. Uh, I think data stores are kind of the same way. You've got, uh, you've got many to choose from. They're all different. And they all require, they're all good at different things, and they all require different types of care and feeding. Um, we use a variety of different things. We use MySQL, of course. We use Memcache. We use uh, Redis. We use MongoDB. We use Sphinx. And actually, we use the plain old boring file system for some things as well. So my agenda for this talk is really just to kind of give you a, a couple high-level pictures of some things that go on at Craigslist, and then kind of just walk through each of these and talk about where we use them and why, and then uh, hopefully answer some questions at the end. So what this really is all about is, is, is trying to choose the right tool for the job. Um, a lot of times you have, a, you have a problem and you look at it and say, oh, I know I can fit this, I can kind of fit this problem into this particular mold because that's the mold I'm familiar with working in. And for a long time, that's kind of what we had to do. Uh, if you, all you had was a memcache or MySQL, it was like, well, okay, do I, do I need indexes? Well, it's probably got to go in MySQL. Um, do I want a query language? It's probably got to go in MySQL. Is it just key value stuff? Well, I can probably do memcache if, if that, that's good enough. Um, and there's a bunch of things to look at. I mean, it's not just uh, does it fit the model I'm used to. It's you know what are the durability requirements? You know, does this data need to persist, or is it is it really transient? Um, how fast does it really need to be? You know, we always want our stuff to be as fast as possible, but what are the real requirements? Uh, do I need a query API, or can I just fetch the thing if I know its name? Uh, how expressive does that query API need to be? Uh, one of the recurring jokes I've heard throughout the last day and a half of the conference has been that every new SQL system is implementing SQL on top of itself, uh, which says something about people's desire to have a very expressive query language because that's what a lot of us are used to. Um, features as well. I mean, it, features and complexity kind of go hand in hand. Uh, features, more features tends to mean more complexity, and that tends to mean uh, it's more challenging to deal with, especially when you're doing things like performance tuning or uh, just general support. And when it comes to support, what kind of support is available? Uh, is it just ask on a mailing list? Is it, is it hire someone? Is it um, pay a company to, to answer the phone when you've got problems? Is it go into the source code yourself? Um, I've been involved in doing all of the above, and uh, sometimes it's more tolerable than others to not have someone to call. Um, so really, it's just it's this whole list of things. And like I said, this, this, this is a relatively new problem for a lot of us because in the past, the choices seemed a lot clearer. Uh, part of it is that we have more options. Uh, one of the last talks I was in talked about just this, the website that tracks no SQL databases. I had 120 some entries on it now. Um, but part of it too is I think the, the expectations have gone up quite a bit. Uh, building apps on the web isn't new anymore. Uh, it's not a novelty. It's not just about pulling a couple items of a database and throwing them on a page. It's about building applications and building complex systems. And when you do that, the expectations go up, the requirements go up, and, um, and so there are a lot more things to consider along the way. So what does it look like at Craigslist as far as, um, you know, people, I gave a talk one time at a user group and someone asked me a question. They said, you know, I, I send a posting to, to Craigslist, what happens? I was like, well, that's a really good question. Uh, the answer took 20 minutes and a big whiteboard. So I can't reproduce that on a slide. I tried. Uh, but what I can do is I can talk about a little bit of it, our, our infrastructure and kind of show you a diagram, which is what you've got here. You know, This is what a typical read request looks like. It comes in from a browser, hits a load balancer. 
that load balancer then sends the request to one of a number of caching proxies. Uh, this is custom written code in the proxy. It's a, it's a Perl caching proxy that uses ePoll, can handle many, many, many connections at once. And like many other proxies, it has uh, access to memcache, so it can fetch things out of cache and send it right back to the browser if it's cached. If not, it can turn around and hit a backend web server. Uh, our infrastructure is primarily Mod Perl and Apache. So uh, the web servers all run Apache, all run Mod Perl. It turns out there's enough memory available on our web servers that we also run some memcache instances there as well. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So request gets to the web server, and this is for something like fetching a posting to look at, running a search, or just browsing the site and kind of you know paging through things. Uh, that's kind of what this what this request flow represents. So the web server gets the request, has to decide what to do with it. In order to fulfill any request, it's going to have to ask another backend data store or multiple backend data stores for something. Um, sometimes what it wants is just a uh, simple posting. So we've got this, this thing off on the right in the middle there. I label it async services. We've got this platform where, where we can run a bunch of async services. Again, uh, it's kind of a Perl daemon using ePoll and a bunch of uh, classes that know how to fetch data for us asynchronously. A lot of times that's just fetching data out of memcache. So there's another caching layer involved here, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, if the data is not available in cache there, I can go to MySQL to get that data. And actually we run, a lot of our MySQL requests now run through HAProxy. Uh, it gives us e an easier way to spread the load out among our servers. It makes it easier to take a server down and not have to, not have to worry about requests um, getting interrupted and worry about all the web servers having to know about it and things like that. Uh, some requests, the web server doesn't need to send off for an async uh, lookup. If it's a search request, I can send that s straight to our Sphinx clusters. Um, or if it's a, for an older posting, it can go to our MongoDB archive. So again, this is just the, the simple, simple case of um, touching a posting or running a search or just browsing the site. This is kind of what the general flow looks like. Uh, I mentioned again that we've got multiple instances of memcache running. Uh, on the upper right where it says caching proxy, we refer to that as a proxy cache. This is where we cache fully rendered pages, both compressed and uncompressed. So huge volume of traffic coming in and most of it comes right out of memory and never goes past that caching layer. Uh, because the posting that you see for a bicycle on the website is the exact same one that someone else sees for that same bicycle. Um, we don't do lots of fancy customization when you're logged into the site, so we don't have to serve you a custom page. It looks like everyone else's. On the web server layer, I said there's memcache there as well. We, we refer to this as the posting cache. This is more of an object cache. It's a lower level thing. So when postings come out of our MySQL database, they're represented in a particular data structure. We actually serialize that, stick it in cache as well. So that minimizes the hits that have to go to the back end database. And then uh, over on the async services layer, there's another cache there that we store some other transient data in as well. So we've got multiple layers of caching going on here. We also have images on the site. Uh, people post images with their ads. That's a lot simpler. Uh, same top tiers there. Request comes into the browser, hits the load balancer, goes to the caching proxy. If the image isn't in cache, it turns around and sends it to our image storage layer, which is, again, Apache, Mod, Perl, and really just a bunch of disks. You know, all running, we're using XFS as our file system, and we just splat the images out in a particular using a particular formula in a particular directory hierarchy, they just sit on disk there. And they do get replicated to multiple nodes, sort of uh, HDFS-like, so that if one of them drops off, the images are available on other machines as well. This is probably one of our simplest pieces of infrastructure from that point of view. So if I step back a layer, I'm, I'm not gonna draw, uh, I didn't draw the diagram of what happens with rights and what happens with all these other things. I was like, that, that gives you a flavor of what's going on. What are the different data about repositories we have and what do we do with them? Well, I'll just start with the uh, top left. We have MongoDB, which is relatively new for us. Um, all of our old postings go into MongoDB eventually. We refer to this as our archive. There's approaching three billion items in there. Um, and if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area in early May, go to Mongo SF and I'll talk about that in much, much more detail. Um, we also have been playing with MongoDB to store some metadata about email stuff that happens on the site. That's kind of experimental right now. Um, I mentioned memcache already. Down at the bottom, we've got, we use it for some internal counting of stuff, like for rate limiting and speed limiting type things. 
Uh, we use it to store cache postings, uh, various blobs and other objects and things like that. It's kind of used ubiquitously as just a, a caching layer for tons of things. We have MySQL, MySQL in, in a number of different clusters. We have one for postings, where all the postings go. That's the big one, because there's, there's millions and millions of postings. Uh, we've got users, tens of millions of those. That's a separate cluster. We have another cluster for abuse, which is just all sorts of metadata we track trying to figure out when people are being bad. Uh, we have a stats cluster, which is where we can sort of aggregate and count up all our hits and stuff like that. You know, we should be using Hadoop or something, but it's just a bunch of Perl scripts today. So, uh, We have a finance cluster. We have to keep track of the, of the money. Uh, we do charge for some things. So some people ask, how does Craigslist make money? We, we actually charge for a few things. Uh, we have some miscellaneous meta databases that we store some stuff in. Um, we've got uh, another cluster that kind of uses we also use MySQL as a work queue in a, in a couple particular cases. And our monitoring system is built on top of MySQL to some levels, to some degree as well. So that's all MySQL. Um, we have Redis deployed in a number of roles as well. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Redis at all? Good. So I won't tell you a lot about what it is. Uh, I'll just say it's, a, it's kind of like a, a middle ground between Memcache and uh, something like MySQL or MongoDB. In, in sort of an in-memory data structure server, so you can do some basic logic with data structures uh, right where the data lives. Um, so we use it for various, uh, storing various counters and lists and blobs of things. Um, it's used a lot in our monitoring infrastructure. Uh, it's also used a lot in our abuse infrastructure. Those are the two places we use it most. Um, there are some other ancillary places that don't matter as much. We use a file system. The upper right box. Well, of course, we store all our logs in the file system, and they eventually get aggregated again to a larger file system. Um, and uh, the diagram I showed you about images uh, earlier. Um, we use Sphinx. How many of you use or know of a Sphinx for full text search? OK, so we've been using that for a few years now. Uh, we index all the postings for full text search. So when you come to Craigslist and type something in the search box, you're using Sphinx. Um, we have some internal tools where we use that as well for uh, different views of the data that only people inside Craigslist get to see. Uh, we're in the process of indexing our forums in Sphinx, and that entire archive, the almost 3 billion postings in our archive are indexed as well full text. So that's all Sphinx. So again, it's a little bit of a complicated picture. It's not the simple stuff it used to be a few years ago. So let me, let me dig in and talk about a few things. Um, some of this I've, I've already shown you graphically, but I'll reiterate. Uh, with MySQL, we are doing um, we're doing a couple types of partitioning. We do sort of vertical partitionings in terms of the different clusters. I mentioned we have you know our user cluster we refer to as the, the off cluster, which is you know login information and things like that, which is separate from postings, which is separate from finance, which is separate from you know various other things. But then within each of those clusters, we partition down into various roles. And I have a graphical example of this. I'll show you. I'll just skip to that and come back. Looks like this. So the idea here is you've got a cluster of, let's say, eight machines running MySQL, all, all in a particular thing, such as the postings role. Um, traditionally, we've actually split those hosts up into subgroups based on the intended use. So we've got the red one there, which we, you know, is the right handle. We'll refer to it in our code. That's the master database. That's where all the writes are going. But then you've got another group of machines there that we refer to as they live behind the read handle in our code which is where all the fast lookups go. If you're going to look up something based on primary key or fetch a single row or a small number of rows, you're going to hit the read handle. And there's usually some number of those there at a minimum, you know, three or four of those, let's say. If you've got a longer query, but it's still indexed, I mean, you kind of know what it is. I mean, you might fetch 10,000 or 50,000 rows or something like that. You're going to go to those light blue ones, which we refer to as the long reads. And if you've got sort of an ad hoc query that could take a couple of minutes, it may do a full table scan. Who knows? It's, you know, it's a very kind of a reporting type thing. You're going to go to the one we call the thrash handle, which is the one in the, the, the green. It's green because anything goes there. Um, as you can imagine, the monitoring thresholds on these different types can be a little different at times. Uh, we don't care if there's a runaway query, query on that thrash handle. Uh, it'll finish. But we don't want to see long running queries on the read handles. Question? So yes, that discernment is baked into, into our HA proxy config. So there's a, there's a level in the code at which you request a particular type of handle um, by, by its name, which then maps to a DNS entry, well, which maps to a DNS entry that points to, 
it, the right HA proxy with the config there to send it to the right servers. It's a little more complicated than it used to be. Um, the last one there, the gray one on the right, we refer to as the dumper. Uh, that's how we do backups. Is there's a machine in every pool that we just, you know, we stop MySQL or we'll run extra backup on it and we'll do dumps periodically and that's our backup scheme. Um, this is not the best utilization of hardware available. I mean, we, you know, if we wanted to really share the load, we share the load among all the machines. But this gives us a lot of control, a lot of predictability. Um, it's up to the developer to choose the right handle when they're writing a particular piece of code, but that's not that hard. You generally know what kind of data you're working with. You can look at a query and know what it's going to do. You know how it's going to perform. And really, you know, we write queries into code once in a while. The code runs millions of times a day. The amount of times we actually write new code is, is, is pales in comparison. So you get that right, and things are generally pretty predictable. Uh, it also makes it, um, like I said, we can set different monitoring thresholds and all sorts of things like that. So this is something that, that I've drawn a few times for vendors on whiteboards, and people look at it and go, oh, yeah, we don't really do it that way, but I can understand why you do. So that's why I wanted to uh, present a visual version of this. So I'll, I'll skip back now. So that's what that subpartitioning is for the various roles. Uh, we use lots of solid state disk storage, primarily Fusion IO on our servers. Um, I actually did a talk uh, at the Percona Live in San Francisco like a year ago where I talked about how we were able to vastly improve performance on, on our back end by getting rid of like 20 servers and replacing them with three. It's because we got rid of 20 disk based servers and replaced them with three boxes that had Fusion IO cards in them. And uh, it also radically increased the capacity in, in terms of IOPS as well. So we're very, very, very happy. It solved most of our performance problems. Um, we actually can't imagine a world in which we would go back to disk-based storage because we're probably past the point at which we can reasonably build RAID arrays that would be fast enough for us. There are a few manual tasks related to MySQL that we do deal with. And when I say we, I mean the systems administration team and not myself. Uh, one of them is in the front row today. Um, Things like recloning slaves if one face plants for some reason, or we add a new machine to a pool, or swapping masters, which we occasionally do. Um, have any of you seen the Linux kernel bug where your box might reboot after 207 or 202 days? Or whatever? Yeah, that sucks. All our masters were rebooted and swapped because of that, or, or almost all of them, there's a few left. So that sort of stuff is, it happens manually. Uh, we try to automate everything as much as we can otherwise. Uh, we're running MySQL 5.5 almost across the board, um, although as of the recent 5.6 stuff, I'm, I think we're really excited about trying to move in that direction. Uh, the combination of global transaction IDs plus crash safe slaves means, you know, recloning is not going to be that common an operation. If a box fails, you can just bring it back up. Uh, reclone, you know, cloning a box will be because we're adding a, a new empty machine into a pool. And, you know, we can probably just restore that from a backup and, and let it catch up. Um, that's going to be really, really cool. Um, I have to say, as skeptical as I was a year or two ago, I think Oracle has done a really good job continuing to pump out really useful features, and uh, we're happy about that. We do use InnoDB all over the place. There's a few little MySAM bits that are left here and there. Um, they cause us pain occasionally when a you know, table crashes or something. But uh, uh, anywhere we can, we do use InnoDB compression. Things like our postings database, you know, postings on Craigslist are just a bunch of text and some images. Those compress really well. Uh, so we get we get a lot of uh, a lot of mileage out of that. Um, on the big boxes, we're typically running with buffer pools around 48 gigs. Um, this is on a box with 72 gigs of RAM. Uh, we can push it higher, but when you've got fast flash storage behind it, you almost don't notice the difference. Question? So on the compression, did we use Facebook's patch or did the straight MySQL? We're using the straight MySQL stuff. Um, and we're using, I believe we're using the lowest level of compression available, so we're really only getting two to one, I think. Um, yes, that's right. We're using the 8K. Yeah. We're not using Facebook patch, that's right. We've, no, we've had no issues with it. It's been great. Uh, I mentioned, you saw in the diagram, HA proxy sits between our, our database, all the read databases, and, uh, and the clients. That's a relatively new addition, mainly to, because in the past, when we added or removed databases from a particular, from behind a particular handle that involved updating DNS and then updating, like, kicking all of our web servers and stuff, and it was really disruptive. So putting HA proxy in there made it a heck of a lot easier. Question? How do you avoid uh, half proxy becoming a single point of 
How do we avoid HA proxy becoming a single point of failure itself? We do that by running multiple instances and round round, well, the clients sort of round robin between them. We've got logic on all of our clients that knows how, they kind of keep state of all of the services it needs to contact. So there's three HA proxy instances. If one of them it fails, then we lower the confidence in it. If it fails again, we lower it further. And eventually we'll just back off and only try it very infrequently until it returns to health. So uh, we sort of work around dead stuff that way. Uh, so we saw this. Yes, question. Yes. So the question is, are we using persistent connections? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, uh, at least on our web tier, which is the majority of the activity, the connections between the webbies and the database servers are non-persistent. And it's been that way for a long time. Uh, mainly, this goes back pre-HA proxy to concerns on the, the master about too many open connections at once. Um, now, the hardware has advanced a generation or two since then, but the, the idea in the past is to try to keep the number of open connections to the master as low as possible. And um, we turn off the DNS lookups and all that stuff. So connecting and disconnecting from MySQL is very fast now. Uh, it's cheap enough that we do it all the time. So we don't do persistent connections at least in that layer. So why do we use MySQL? I think, you know, sort of like Mark Callahan said this morning in his keynote, uh, it, it's the devil we know, it was there. Um, it was at Craigslist when I got to Craigslist. That's part of the reason I went there. Um, I knew MySQL and they had MySQL issues and I, I kind of went to help. Um, we've got a fair amount of uh, developer and administrative type skills in that area, so we know how to run it. Um, it doesn't surprise us very often. It's um, very durable. Uh, the built-in replication works well in many instances. Um, the support's been great. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. It's like, look around at this conference. Look at the ecosystem. Um, there's more than one company you can go to for just about anything related to MySQL now, which is, which is really cool. Uh, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that way several years ago. So things have really grown up. Um, the relational data model works really well for a lot of stuff we do. So it's kind of the de facto choice. And we, we trust it. Um, I reversed my slides, look at that. Anyway, um, so I'll talk about, I talked briefly about what we did with Memcache at Craigslist. It's a cache for various things, fully rendered pages, compressed uh, and full size, uh, very serialized objects, postings, uh, various metadata and things like that, various transient data blobs. Um, one of the interesting things that happened is several years ago, one of our engineers built a custom async client library that works in that async service pool I talked about earlier. Um, that's prove, proven to work incredibly well once the bugs were worked out. Um, one of the issues with developing your own code is occasionally there's weird little bugs in there, like the fact that it's got a space delimited protocol, and if you fed a request into the system and didn't, things weren't escaped properly, you'd have really weird hard to debug problems, which we had for a while. Um, but those are all past us, I hope. Um, and we, one of the things we do is we actually do get some durability out of memcache by, in some instances, we sort of do a, a client-side mirroring where, the, where the, the, the code that's writing to memcache will actually write to sort of two halves of a cache at the same time so that we get sort of a RAID 1 with memcache. Um, we don't lose cache instances very often, but we almost never lose two at the same time. So it works really well for transient stuff that we kind of want to hold on to. Things like session data, this is good for. So user sessions on the website, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to put that on disk, but it'd be nice if losing one web server didn't mean, or losing one cache server didn't mean dropping sessions. So we treat some of the data that way. Um, why we use it, it's wickedly fast, stable. I mean, it's really proven technology. It's been around for a long, long time. Um, there's kind of no administration required. You just, once you get it up and running, it just runs. Um, you know, it's, it's very rare that we've had to go in and worry about upgrading or changing anything. Um, coexists really well with CPU intensive stuff. So, you know, the, the kind of hardware you're getting nowadays, it's like you've got many, many gigs of RAM, many, many cores available. Fine, run multiple instances. Uh, even if you've got CPU intensive stuff in the box, it'll still work fine because Memcache itself doesn't take a lot of CPU resources. It just gobble up as much memory as you want to give it, so you can pair things together, and it works out really well. It's a great, it's a great way to share hardware without going down the virtualization um, rat hole. So, was there a question in back? Yeah. Yes. 
I, I didn't quite hear that. I heard Membase, uh, and I can say, no, we haven't tried it. Right. Have not tried it. Um, so um, what do we do with uh, Redis at Craigslist? Um, it's really the kind of the primary repository of a bunch of metadata used in various analysis tasks we have. Um, that's my high level speak for abuse stuff. Um, I can't talk much about what we do with what kind of data goes in there. Um, we replicate the data into a second data center. So we actually do run Craigslist in multiple data centers, although generally for the most services, one data center is active and the other is kind of standby. So we use the built in replication and slave everything off to a second data center. Um, more, well over 80% of our data is in what's called sorted sets or Z sets, if you know, uh, if you know Redis very well. And uh, we, we have a multi-node cluster and do sharding of data across all the nodes in that cluster. Um, this bit.ly link here is a link to a presentation, I wrote, or, uh, to a blog posting I wrote that describes the details of how we do that, kind of what the configuration looks like. Uh, I've actually been meaning to open source that code. I've got approval to do it, and it's almost done. I just kind of haven't done it yet. Um, but if you're in a Perl shop and want that, let me know, and maybe I'll, I'll finish it off. So why do we use it? Um, well, first of all, the feature set. It's, it's a, got a really, it's got a really cool mix of features and performance. Uh, being able to have server-side lists and sets and sorted lists of things um, is so much more than what Memcache can do as far as representing interesting data. And the fact that there are all these nice atomic operations means we can just fire off requests to increment counters or add things or remove things. And it just works really, really well. Um, we get a really, you've got your choice of persistence models with it. Um, you can keep everything in memory and never put it on disk. You can replicate it off like we do to a second set of machines. Um, you can persist things to disk periodically through what's called just snapshotting. Um, you, can, you can write sort of an append-only file, which is kind of like a bin log sort of thing. Um, so you can recover from crashes and lose zero or very small amounts of data. Uh, the API is great. Um, it, it's kind of like having all the, it's kind of like having all of the, the sort of primitive data structures we're used to in scripting languages like uh, Perl or Python or, or, uh, or Ruby available to us except that the data lives outside the process. It lives out in the network or out in the cloud and you can just get access to it and share it among the processes very easily. It really changes the way you think about some programming problems and some data storage problems. And the kind of the whole project vision really, the guys running the project have a really clear vision of where things need to go and they've been very good about listening to the community too. So I'm very happy about that. And like Memcache, it um, very low on CPU use, makes very good use of memory. So again, when you've got lots of cores or high, high CPU intensive things, you can pair them together and, and they, they will cohabitate very well in the same hardware. So I mentioned MongoDB a few times. Um, it is our repository of two and a half to three billion, whatever the current count is, archived postings. That means if you come to Craigslist, post something, and then come back a couple years later and want to find that posting again, you can log in and grab that posting and repost it. You know, maybe you hired someone and you need to repost the job because they left. Uh, that happens. Um, the archive is interesting because it's constantly growing. Uh, we don't delete. We just keep adding stuff to it. And um, MongoDB gives us a really easy way to continue to grow that collection that was not easy to do when this used to be in MySQL. Uh, the other great thing about MongoDB is it is um, the document store, so there's no fixed schema. In the past, we used to have to occasionally run an alter table in this thing when it lived in MySQL, and that would take a month. Um, no one wants a month long alter table. Um, we currently have three shards and three, um, that we have three shards, which you can think of as uh, actual replica set clusters. So there's three shards of data, three no replica sets, so there's nine machines in total in each data center. And, um, I looked earlier and there was about six terabytes of data on disk in each cluster uh, when I added it up. And then we sized it for about 12, so we, we can kind of double it in size before we have to think about adding bigger disks or adding more machines. Um, the hardest thing here was the data migration. Uh, I gave two talks, at, uh, one at Mongo SF, one at Mongo SV about this. The, there are links there for them and the, the slides for this will be online. So you can watch the video and see the slides where the first talk is like, hey, I'm planning to do this. Here's how I'm thinking it's going to work. And then a year later, I came back and was like, we did it. Here's what we learned along the way. And um, needless to say, the most painful part of this was the migration itself. 
shuffling two billion documents out of MySQL and into MongoDB reliably um, was uh, it took took some time and it took a lot. It took several runs before I got it right. Um, so it was it was very challenging, but it was well worth the pain. Uh, again, we chose it because it was schema free. Uh, there are a lot of NoSQL options or document stores to choose from. Uh, MongoDB won because it had a very active community. There is commercial support available. You know, this is one of those things where it's like, we don't mind paying someone to get some support. And uh, TenGen has done a great job of, of kind of setting up a structure for that. Um, very important to us, there was a good pro client. TenGen actually supported the pro client. They built it. Um, you know, there are some database data stores out there that have a Perl interface, but the author is doing it in their spare time or may have abandoned it. I've heard a few stories from people this week about that. Um, so it was important to us to have a good client available. The um, ease of scaling was a huge thing too. We were sick of every year or so having to look at this archive MySQL cluster and saying, what's the biggest SATA disks we can buy now? Or, you know, or SAS disks and going in and they have to swap out all the disks and clone stuff and it was this big stupid nightmare. Uh, with the Mongo setup we can basically add new nodes to the cluster or add an entire shard and let Mongo handle the, the, the task of rebalancing things for us. Um, so the ease of scaling is a huge win. Uh, also having fewer points of failure because of the way the replica sets work. Um, we're running this on relatively new hardware and it has been a bumpy road with that new hardware. We've lost machines multiple times and um, we've never lost data availability. We've lost the ability occasionally to write to the cluster, but we've always been able to get data out of it. So it's been, it's been great. You know, it's been basically the failures are either worked around or they're worked around to the point that things work well enough, we can go in and poke something and then things come back to life. So that's, um, that's better than we've had in the past. So I mentioned Sphinx a few times. Um, basically, it's our full text indexing and search weapon of choice for all live postings, for all archive postings, and all of our forum content, which is in progress now. Well, the indexing is done. We just haven't switched over to using it on the back end. Um, we get easily 300 million queries a day against Sphinx for our live postings. And uh, scaling that is, I was going to say scaling that is easy, but during the conference we've actually run into a few issues that I've been dealing with. Mostly my own fault for not doing some better capacity planning. But um, it's worked out really well. We've been very happy with Sphinx. Um, it's fast. It's really, really freaking fast. Um, I've, I've never had a performance problem with it that I could not attribute to some stupid misconfiguration on my part or just, you know, poorly sized hardware. Um, the APIs are great. The, the native API that's been there for a long time works really well. Um, in recent years, they've added um, MySQL protocol support and a subset of SQL. So you can fire up a Sphinx server, connect it with a MySQL client, fire SQL at it, and get back full text search results. It's really cool. Uh, for us, it's going gonna, it's gonna to eliminate some, some extra code that we don't need and be able to simplify things. I'm actually thinking about putting it behind HAProxy just like we do with our MySQL instances because they're speaking the same protocol now. Uh, it works out really, really well. Um, we get a really flexible deployment model with Sphinx. Um, you can run Sphinx as a, as a standalone thing on one, in one, one server. Uh, the way we're deploying it is we've got master-slave clusters just like we do with our databases where the master just builds indexes all day and the slaves replicate them and serve live queries. Um, you can do that. You can uh, just have something called Sphinx SE, which is the Sphinx storage engine built into MySQL. So you can actually, and MariaDB I think has this by default, where you can literally just insert data right into that, and then you've got full text search sort of built into MySQL, which is far, far better than the full text search that MySQL had with my ISAM. Um, there's commercial support and consulting available, which we've made good use of. Uh, there are a few features that exist in Sphinx because we, we requested and paid for them. Um, and they've been really great about fixing the occasional bugs we've run into. Um, I don't think it's buggy software at all. We just, I have a habit of running the bleeding edge code all the time. I build our stuff from their subversion repository and because they have a new feature I want and then occasionally we find some issues, but it's worked incredibly well for us. Question? Have, you using real -time indexing? have we started using real-time indexing? Yes. Um, we have real-time indexes running. They've been running for a couple months now. Um, I, can't tell you what sort of production workload they take because the indexes are running all the time, data is constantly updating, but the front end interface to query that stuff hasn't been built yet. So, so we're not doing replication on the real time indexes, we're running multiple completely autonomous instances of basically duplicate data. Um, 
And what we're doing is at a higher level, we're going to blend results from the real-time indexes and the, the, uh, the larger old indexes at query time. Um, so, yeah, replication of... There's some interesting features that could be built into Sphinx natively for index replication, either in the traditional model or the real-time model, which if you're coming to Sphinx search day tomorrow, I may talk about my presentation there. I'll talk a heck of a lot more detail about what we do with Sphinx tomorrow if you go to Sphinx search day. I mentioned that we use file system. You know, that's a pretty simple old technology for storing data and retrieving it. Uh, all, like I said, all uploaded images are stored on machines just in the file system. We use XFS for all of our image boxes. We use XFS on all of our MySQL boxes for the file system. Um, images come in at some whatever random size the user uploads them in. We resize them, save them to disk, and then uh, they persist until such time as they expire and they get cleaned up. Question. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, what's the question? How do we handle the traffic? That's part of our job. <laughs> so, oh, well, so well, well, yeah, no, it's it's actually interesting. Um, actually, let me let me get back to that at the end because there's a couple of points I'll make at the very end and, and talk about that. Um, so why do we use a file system for this? Well, it's reliable and simple. I mean, it just works. Um, XFS has proven technologies work really, really well. Uh, it doesn't have any of the weird concurrency issues or bottlenecks that uh, some of the other file systems have seen. And you know, the reality is it's incredibly easy to work with. If you need to move data around, you can you can use whatever Unix tools you want to move data around, uh, either within a single system or R-syncing across other systems. Uh, great, fairly low-level stuff. It works in this case because there's really no indexes or other weird metadata that we have to worry about or synchronize. Um, we have a very we have a deterministic algorithm for here is the name or, or URL for an image, and we can look at that and know which which nodes it should live on, so we can go find it. So it's very simple, brain, brain dead, but it works. So it's interesting with all these data stores out there. Um, it's like we, you're going to be an expert in everything. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, it is tricky because as developers, um, you have to know enough about each one of the ones you want to interact with to do something. Um, but that's challenging in our environment. We're not a big company. We don't have people who specialize in everything. Uh, a lot of us are semi-generalist. And um, so what we did is back at the time that I did that archive migration, moving stuff out of MySQL and into MongoDB, we took a step back and said, you know, we really need some kind of abstraction layer here so that everyone in the company doesn't have to suddenly learn how to, how to talk to MongoDB. So we built an abstraction layer that sits on top of, not all, but several of our data stores. Um, and you, you, we, we built a very dumbed down query language for it. Uh, it's just a simple Boolean language with ands and ors, and there are different operators it supports. And uh, you can ask it for stuff, and it knows how to go find that on your behalf. So it knows how to fetch things from our, our, our um, memcache, posting cache, for example. It knows how to find things from MySQL, knows how to fetch stuff out of Sphinx, and knows how to fetch things from MongoDB. Um, this is one of those things that was like, we realized we just had to bite the bullet and do it. It's not done in any sense, because we keep adding to it and keep evolving it. Uh, but I think it's going to make it a lot easier for us to build new things with this, this, this uh, sort of proliferation of different data stores behind the scenes. The, um, the whole notion of relational versus non-relational and the arguments about that, you know, it's like, I gotta break it to you. It, it, for most stuff, it doesn't matter. I mean, for a lot of the stuff we do, it doesn't matter. What you're working with is the data in your code. Um, so much of what happens, I think, is is we get in arguments about whether relational is the right way to do it or non-relational is the right way. And you know, in a lot of cases, it just, just doesn't matter because if you're pulling data from multiple sources anyway, you're, you're not going to be doing cross-system joins or anything like that. What matters is that you've chosen the right tool for the job, or the best tool you can find for the job, like I said earlier on, and you're comfortable with running it, and you know how to, how to interact with it. Um, I think the NoSQL thing is kind of a stupid label. Uh, like several people have pointed out this week, there are people building SQL on top of non-relational things, so it's kind of a, a silly label, but I guess for our purposes it just means not MySQL. Um, there are a couple of questions I get asked a lot on the technical side about Craigslist. Um, 
So here are the answers to them. Uh, we're self-hosted. We don't do any virtualization or cloud stuff. World's goal. Data centers, racks, servers, switches, power. Um, there's no EC2, no S3, none of that. Um, we control all our own infrastructure. We sort of control our destiny to the extent that we can. Um, we want people to know that when they upload stuff to Craigslist that we got the data. We're not giving it to other people. It's there. Um, it's, uh, it's been tricky. You, know, you do everything yourself, which is not always easy. You know, People make the argument, it's like, well, you could get rid of some of your systems administration team if you ran stuff on Amazon. It's like, I don't think that's true, because someone's still got to worry about what happens when instances go down and all these other things. Um, so for us, this is a choice we've made. It's worked out pretty well. Uh, the answer to the question about how do we make things fast, how do we handle the traffic, well, we get you know multi-gigabit links to the internet, we get agreements with bandwidth providers, and we just do it. We don't have any CDNs involved. We do it ourselves. We don't use a CDN, no point. We can do it ourselves cheaper. Um, you know, we've, if you've got enough cash available and you're smart about how you, how you plan for things, you can handle the traffic. Um, so we get you know, tens of thousands of hits per second. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, and uh, we're able to handle it without having tens of thousands of machines. Um, we do, on the hardware side, we do have a mix of hardware. Uh, we're primarily on two vendors these days, but it's a mix of, of blades for things like web servers and, and, um, and Redis boxes and memcache and stuff like that. And then larger multi-U, uh, I say multi-U or multi-disc RAID boxes. Um, a lot of the RAID has gone away because we're using Fusion I.O. cards now, but it's the same chassis with Fusion I.O. cards in them now instead of RAID, but you know, instead of lots of disks. It just depends on, on what you're looking at. Uh, so we do have quite a mix of hardware in there. Um, there's really no vendor we love. We hate them all. So you just kind of got to pick whoever you want to deal with. <laughs> uh, every year we have a new vendor we hate on. So it's just, you know, it's usually whoever we chose in the previous year to buy from. So we do mostly local storage, either on disk or on flash. Um, uh, there's very little production stuff that hits our SAN. The SAN is primarily there for storing things like backups and snapshots and other big data stuff that we need to keep around, uh, logs and stuff like that. Um, we use almost exclusively all open source infrastructure. I mean, our, the business logic of Craigslist isn't open source, but all the, almost all the tools we use are. You know, we're built on Linux and Apache, uh, Mod Perl, we use MySQL, we use Redis, all the things I name. This is all open source stuff. Uh, we're, not, we're not throwing much proprietary stuff in the mix here, and it's kind of nice not to because uh, there have been many occasions we've had to go dig into the code to figure something out. Um, it's, it's one of those one of those things that's like once you once you run beyond a certain scale, you're going to trip on bugs that other people haven't seen or haven't seen frequently enough to dig into, and then you have to dig into them and see what's going on. And we do have a very small but growing tech team. Um, I know you, you haven't heard this at all this week, but um, we're hiring. Um, <laughs> Front-end developers, back-end developers, systems administrators, network engineers, we need them all. So my email address is just the letter Z at craigslist.org. Send me a plain text resume if you're interested. Come find me later or come find Josh, this guy in the front row here is one of our systems administrators. Um, and I have a few minutes left over for questions, so hopefully I didn't breeze through that too quickly. Yes? Could, could, could you actually, could you maybe speak up a little bit or come a little closer? So the, we are storing, we're storing archived documents in MongoDB, that's right, and they are, and we are using Sphinx for the indexing of it. Um, if you come to my MongoDB talks, one of the things I always say is I think there are certain things the MongoDB team needs to do, and I think one of them would be to build in standard hooks so that you can plug an external search tool into MongoDB, read the op log, and index things automatically. That doesn't exist yet. They, they want to build full text search on their own. It's on their roadmap, and I understand why. They want to have an everything in one box solution, and that makes sense for the market, but people who do their own things also want hooks for doing those things as well. Um, Sphinx is just the search technology we've chosen and have been using for years, but um, there's no reason you couldn't use Solar or something like else in conjunction with MongoDB. Way in the back. Uh, you mentioned Fusion I.O. cards. Yes. Uh, how they work now compared to like, the regular drives? 
So the question is, how has Fusion I.O. worked out for us compared to regular drives? Um, how does a bicycle compare to a Corvette? <laughs> Um, they've worked out really well, I'll be honest. I mean, we had, um, you know, we, we had to make a substantial investment. The hardware is not cheap. Um, we bought enough of it to be able to run most of our databases off of Fusion I.O. And um, it's wickedly fast. I mean, it's, it's amazing when, when, when basically slave lag goes away, alter tables that used to take hours take minutes or seconds. Um, so many problems went away as a result of that. Uh, we've had very, very, very few issues as far as things like stability or bugs or driver issues and things like that. Um, so it's worked really, really well. Um, now, having said that, there's, it's interesting to watch the, the games that the, like, just the, the SATA disks, you know, the Intel and Micron, everyone else are making. You know, they're catching up in performance to what the first generation Fusion IO stuff was. So you can still get a lot of bang for your buck in that form factor too. Um, the single Biggest bang comes when you go from spinny disks to any form of flash because it's it's like a, you know it's an order of magnitude difference on seek time, and for most people, if your working set's not in memory or barely in memory, that's what's going to dominate your ability to, to scale things. So we've been we've been really happy, and like I, you might not have been here earlier, but like I said earlier, is like we we can't imagine going back to a physical disk-based world. It just wouldn't work. Other questions? Yes. That's a great question and something I meant to mention earlier and kind of glossed over. So the question is, how does growth, what do we do for capacity planning and all that? Um, we have the advantage of being a more established company in the web. So we don't have weird, crazy, unpredictable growth because we're not a new startup and we're not a social network. Um, so those are, those are big advantages on the one hand. They're also disadvantages because we've got tons of legacy data and legacy code to kind of drag along with us when we want to change things. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we do sort of an annual review of um, the capacity of all our systems. We, we build something we call our scale document where we look to the next year and say, all right, we know kind of what our historical growth looks like and we kind of apply that and say, well, we think things grew by this percentage last year and the year before, so if I apply that to the current infrastructure, we need to buy more of this or grow this or add boxes to this cluster or whatever. So that's something we do have to do on an annual basis. Um, we, that doesn't mean we don't have to like add stuff mid-year because we got something wrong. Or more likely, we deployed something new that didn't exist the year before, and we just kind of got to keep an eye on it. Um, I think more often than not, the sort of emergency add more hardware stuff comes as a result of additional features or additional stuff that got built. Um, but you know, our, our traffic patterns are, are very predictable, very cyclical. So things like it just hits per second, searches per second, postings per day, all that kind of stuff. You know, we, we can model that out pretty well. Um, and we've tried to get better about that as, as time's gone on. In the way in the back. Um, what are we using for monitoring? Um, unfortunately, we're not using any of the commonly available open source tools for monitoring. Uh, our system has the benefit of being um, completely tailored to our infrastructure and the downside of being completely tailored to our infrastructure, um, which means that anytime we want to add a feature, we have to add the feature. We can't just go download a plugin from someone else and use it. So we're using, we're using a system that's got some of the ideas that you'll see in other, other uh, monitoring tools, but it's, it's all homegrown and I, it, it predates me. I don't know the reasons for that or the choices that were being made back then. So it's all, unfortunately, I, we've joked about open sourcing it, but it's also so, so specific to our infrastructure, I think it would be kind of silly to do that. Um, but it's a, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of Perl and MySQL and GNU plot and various things. Um, there was another question here. Yeah, I was going to ask, how do you guys manage um, things like schema changes or, or just large, you know, MySQL stopping kind of things? So how do we manage large MySQL maintenance type stuff? Um, one of two ways. Um, certain things we are just willing to sort of take the downtime. And our... Um, I don't want to change the slide because I want resumes, but I'll go back. Um, so if I go way back to the beginning, this caching proxy up here has what we refer to as a maintenance mode where we flip a switch and basically it denies write operations, but so much of our traffic is reads anyway that those just keep coming out of cache. And then we can go and tinker stuff behind the scenes. 
So a lot of times, like if we need to swap masters or do a quick schema change that is going to take, when I mean quick, I mean like minutes or an hour or something, we can plan a maintenance window and do that at like 10 or 11 o'clock on the west coast when the east coast is already asleep and just do it. Um, other times, if it's a schema change that can coexist with the live traffic, we just do this the game where it's like, all right, well, we've got to pull 10 machines. Let's do one, then another, then another, and then get to the point where the master is the only one that hasn't seen the change, like if you're adding an index or dropping an index. And then we just plan a quick you know, master swap and then do that and then make the last one the same as all the others. Um, no fancy tools. We don't do the online schema change like, or anything like that. Um, I'm curious to look at those tools and see if they'd work for us, but we haven't really had any time to do that. Yes? What was that one it's again? How do we do what with the MongoDB data? Oh, how do we back up the archive? Um, you want the real answer or the, the hopefully true answer? <laughs> uh, so the, the archive is the archive exists in two data centers. Uh, so that's one form of backup. They're, they're, they're maintained independently, but the same code runs in two data centers, so they can be slightly out of sync, but they're basically doing the same thing. Within each MongoDB, everything's in three node replica sets, so we can lose machines there, uh, and the data is all still there. And we also have two, or we have some big, really beefy disk boxes that we're calling our archive Mongo backup boxes that are eventually going to do backups of our archive. They're not quite done yet. So we're not actually doing real backups. But the plan is we'll occasionally, um, we'll occasionally grab snapshots of the Mongo data and then just um, probably do incremental snapshots of that or do snapshots of that over time. I honestly, it's been so long since we had the discussion. I don't remember which technique we settled on. We had the idea of having a replica set member that would join, you know, running instances that would join the replica sets and we'd stop them occasionally, back them up, rejoin. Um, so we're, we gotta work through that yet. Now the reality is back in the MySQL world, when the archive was in MySQL, we didn't back it up anyway. Because it was like, well, we have all these slaves, we'll just pick another slave, and the data's in multiple data centers. Um, but the plan is to get to a point where we're just doing regular backups without like everything else. So you don't care about problems on the developer just delete them? Well, that developer was me, and I'm hoping I did my job right. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, is, there, is it conceivable that we have some catastrophic data loss? Yeah, it is. Um, but again, they were developed to be completely independent, and um, it's a very controlled system when we put stuff into the archive, it's, and there's a lot of validation steps that have to pass along the way. So it's not just like fire and forget, it's like put it in the archive, wait a little while, go back, try to read it from the archive, read it out, read the one in MySQL, make sure they're the same. Okay, the one in MySQL can probably be deleted now as long as the full text index has got the data as well. So there's a bunch of validation that goes on there as well. So it's, it's actually a fairly, I won't say it's a complicated process, I'll just say it's a multi-step process. Yes? Yeah, is the archive database insert only strictly or do you ever execute updates against the, the billion records? Um, the multi-billion document archive is primarily write only. Uh, we do read from it occasionally, so if you, if you come to Craigslist, log into your account, go into your, your account posting history, that data all comes out of Sphinx because we've got the sort of summaries and stuff there. Uh, but if you click on one of your old postings and say, hey, where's that posting from that car I sold four years ago? And you pull that up, that comes out of Mongo. So we read from it occasionally, but we're primarily writing to it. Um, we, we planned it that way, we sort of saw, we sort of spec the hardware as such that we didn't need crazy numbers of IOPS from it, we just needed lots of storage because it's, it's kind of like a, I won't call it, it's not like cold storage, it's kind of like warm storage. You know, we're putting stuff in there, but it goes in at a pretty predict predictable rate. The big issue with us was, was growth and not having to do schema changes. Any other questions? Right in front. I had a question about this data extraction layer you described. Yeah. Uh, so you have all these, Different types of data store, and they all have different powers, right? They have different yes. So yes. How do you abstract that? For example, you want to put SQL in the MySQL. Yep. So the, the, the question is with this data abstraction layer we wrote, um, if I can paraphrase, it's kind of like, don't you have to dumb it down to the least common denominator of features? And, and yes, we do. Um, the answer is that right now, this is primarily for reading data. Um, code that writes is generally talking directly to a specific data store and knows what to do. 
But for reading, because you know, usually it's one or two developers that are working on putting data into a system, but anyone in the company may need to get that data and look at it. So what we were really optimizing for was making it so that anyone could get at the data they wanted. Um, because the read operations are fairly common, uh, fairly simple. Um, writes, you have to deal with all sorts of other issues. Like if we, we have provisions in here for things like data validation and transactions and all that, but it's just stubbed out. We haven't implemented any of that yet. This is one of those things where we, we, we were really focused on getting the design right and then figured let's implement the minimum subset necessary to get the archive migration done and running. And then as time goes on, we can kind of plumb in the rest of it and eventually move most of our code base to using this. So it's kind of a multi-year work in progress. Yes, uh, right here. So are we sending 100% uh, of our read traffic in MySQL to the slaves? 99.9%, .9%, yes. Um, there are a few cases when we read from masters for various reasons, but the vast majority of it goes to the slaves. Do we have issues with slave behind this? Um, rarely. The problem mostly went away when we went to flash storage because it was all about just not being able to seek on disk fast enough. Um, recently, we've noticed a weird blip where to get around that kernel uptime bug, we upgraded kernels on some boxes, but not all of them yet, because we're mainly concerned about masters um, dying on us. Um, our master database of the postings got upgraded, but the slaves were on older versions, and we noticed some weird replication delays there. And when I mean weird, I mean it would, we'd occasionally see one second, because that's you know the granularity you get in one second. There used to always be zero flatline, and now we see occasional blips on there. It's like, what the heck is going on? Well, Josh upgraded the kernel on one of them a few days ago, and the problem went away on it. So it's some weird, it may even just seem some weird timing thing related to small changes in the kernel, but we really don't see a slave behind problem much anymore. Um, and we are really careful, we have to really be careful like anyone does about not running a million row update query or something like that because we know that's gonna cause problems. We'll plan a maintenance window and do it then. But um, no, generally speaking, the slaves are, are not gonna fall behind. Now, these long read ones I talked about or the thrash one I talked about, those can get behind, but they're kind of designed, they're allowed to get behind, it's no big deal. Um, and like in the finance database, at the beginning of the month, the financial team's always running big reports for the previous month to do billing and whatever they do. They get behind then, but you know, that's, that's fine. No big deal. Any other questions? The one right there. Uh, we're relying on HAProxy quite a bit, that's true. Um, we first brought it into our infrastructure just to sit between clients and the MySQL tier. And um, it's been surprisingly hassle-free. It took a little bit of setup to get it right and get all the config parameters tweaked. And um, we, had to, we had to change our thinking about what it meant when we had to go out and restart various services. Um, it used to be you had to restart certain services every time a database was added or removed from a pool. Now that's not so much the case, um, so the, the disruption is a lot lower, but I think the majority of the challenges were internal to the ways we operated and worked uh, in our procedures than they were anything really technical. Um, it's worked incredibly well. We're using you know, the built-in simple health checks and things like that, and it works really well. Um, you know, we had to build a little bit of monitoring metrics around it, things like that, but um, like I said, it's worked well enough for that. I've, I'm thinking about putting the Sphinx servers behind it as well because it'll give me uh, really good load balancing and, and it'll, let me, it'll let me set a greater delay between before machines fully participate so they can warm caches and things like that. Any other questions? I know I'm probably well over time here, but feel free to leave if there's still questions going on. All right, I think that's it. Thank you for coming. Come talk to me if you're interested.